Good morning. I'm Don Kerrigan. Welcome to this week's Political Brew. We are joined by our analyst, Democratic analyst, Canal Schuler, Republican analyst, Ray Richardson. Let's talk some main activity first. Been quite a week. Governor Janet Mills took the oath of office Wednesday night, the start of her second term as Maine's governor, the oldest ever to serve as governor, I believe. Uh, the governor made a speech talking about hope and for the future of the state. No details really on how she hopes to get us there. But I'll start with you, Ken. What did you think of what the governor had to say? Well, it was Janet Mills being Janet Mills. If you like Janet Mills, it was a great speech. If you don't like Janet Mills, it was not a great speech because you don't like Janet. I mean, it's what you expect the governor to do. It was very similar to her campaign speeches, even kill, positive, upbeat, um, so, I, you know, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I thought she did a good job. I think it was aspirational. And that's what you expect of a governor, to be aspirational. Positive is what we expect of Janet Mills, not negative. A victory lap, right? Yep, absolutely, as you should have. I thought it was okay. I read the transcript of it. Uh, one of the areas that she brought up ever so briefly, but important, was Child Protective Services. I think that's an area where the governor and I and many people around the state who may not normally agree with the governor could work on. Uh, the Ombudsman report came out and it was devastating to the department. So the governor mentioned it briefly about child welfare. I hope that becomes her big focus. That could be Janet Mills's legacy. Yeah, it was a bit of a victory lap, but you know what? Good for her. She won and she won big and no one can deny that. She won by almost 100,000 votes more than anyone's ever gotten. She has a big opportunity here and I hope she will seize it for the good of the people of Maine. We'll see what happens. We'll talk about uh, kind of the first step in doing that in just a moment. But the speech came just a few hours after the legislature finally passed uh, the bill for the home heating assistance proposal that the governor had come out with. Uh, barely got uh, uh, enough for two thirds in the in the state Senate. Uh, the governor signed it into law. But, Ray, I'll ask you, Republicans were still critical of the whole thing. And do you believe that they're correct? Yeah, I think so. Look, uh, when she sent out the 850 last year, if you watch online sales and what happens, the money doesn't usually go where it's directed. I think we could have done some structural things that have long term positive impact. And one of the things the governor could have done, and I've been saying this all along, if she would repeal the gas tax during non uh, tourism time, that would really help people. It's about 31 plus cents a gallon and people fill up, you know, every day, every couple of days here. It would have been very beneficial. I think sending out $450 is a political thing to do. I'm not sure it's really going to help. So I wouldn't have done this if I were governor, and maybe one day I will be, and I wouldn't do this. <laughs> Ken? Well, maybe I could be uh, maybe I could be a chief of staff if, if he runs and wins. Don, you may recall that Ray and I are on the same page with this. I am not a fan of sending checks out to people. Ray is right. They don't necessarily use it to buy heating oil. You need to have a system by which if somebody needs help, they can get it. There should be a way to apply for, for assistance, get assistance on a case-by-case -case need basis. Sending out a check to people, assuming everybody needs it and will do the same thing with it, is just foolish. I am glad it was reduced because it should, it was, it was, I don't agree with this check. I don't agree with a higher check. I don't agree with the Republicans demanding a public hearing because that was a dog and pony show, something we didn't need. Getting two thirds vote is not easy to get in any uh, political climate, but it is political. It is feel good legislation, but I don't think it targets everybody who needs it in the right way. I'm not in favor of it. And I'm happy to be your chief of staff, Ray. You just let me know when, when Thank you, you sign on to this. Well, there's an interesting point here, though. The, uh, there were some Republicans who argued that uh, money was going to people who don't need the help, who can afford to pay for their heating bills, even if they are higher this year. Yet last year, with the $850 checks, I believe Republicans were arguing that more people should be getting those, so having it be de facto tax relief so that more people would get the money. Here, some were arguing that fewer people should get the money, right? I think these are two different issues. Last year was supposed to be a tax relief, you know, relief during COVID, whatever it was they called it, so that it wouldn't be taxable. This is supposedly targeted uh, energy relief during a cold winter. So I agree with that. I don't think those two positions are in conflict. Um, when you give a tax relief check, people that pay taxes ought to get one. But this is supposedly a heating relief check and not everybody needs it. 
Well, and also, Don, that was pre-election. This is post-election. Sending out checks before an election is always good to get votes. That's what the difference right. is. And speaking back to the governor in particular, uh, she is just uh, releasing her proposed biennial budget. She's going to have a press conference, we're told, on it next week to answer some questions. And now that whole process starts. I did an interview with the governor a week ago uh, in which she talked about the budget and saying she was going to be pretty cautious about any added spending, new programs, et cetera. In large part, it appeared because she's quite worried about the possibility of recession. Ken, do you think that's the right approach? Do you think that there will be a lot, especially Democrats, who will push for more new programs? Yeah, Don, I saw that interview and I thought it was excellent. And I think her answer is good if she sticks with it. I am a strong believer in the rainy day fund. It's great to be flush, but there's a day when you're not flush. And if you don't have money saved, you're in trouble. I hope she sticks to her guns. The Democrats are going to be pushing for more and more spending. I hope she holds the line. I hope the Republicans are cooperative with the Democrats who are more conservative and keep the budget reasonable, rational. And as Ray know, I'm all in for lowering taxes any way you can. The, the Republicans have said we'd like to send rebate checks to people if we're flush. That's a, that's once again a political move. I don't agree with it. Cut taxes, put money away, and Ray and I will govern together in peace and harmony. <laughs> Ray, you're yes, we will. Well, I hope the governor does what she said. She said she's going to be cautious because of inflation, uh, uh, recessionary concerns. If she is, we'll see. But look, let's remember she won with a big mandate, and whether I agree with it or not. And the legislature has big majorities for Democrats on both houses. These guys are going to want to do stuff because they feel they were elected to do stuff and they feel they have a mandate to do it. I think she's optimistic if she thinks the budget isn't going to grow. I don't see that happening. I suspect we'll end up somewhere around nine and a half million billion dollars. That's what I, I think when the legislature is done with all this. And because there happens to be money laying around, they just had another projected surplus. Um, I don't see spending restraints here. If it happens, I'll applaud it. We are recording this discussion on Friday while the, what some would call a debacle in the House of Representatives in Washington continues uh, 11th and 12th votes on who will be the new speaker. Ray, I'm going to start with your opinion on this. Kevin McCarthy so far can't seem to pull enough people to get uh, get the majority vote he needs to become speaker. Expect it will happen. But is this a bad thing for Republicans or is this a good thing? I think it's a good thing for the American people personally. I know the political class in America is losing their minds, calling it chaos and embarrassment and all kinds of other things. This is the way this is supposed to work. We're just preconditioned to backroom deals where people get together and decide what we're gonna spend, what we'll spend it on, who the leaders are and what have you. So now we're seeing an old fashioned political debate, Donnybrook, and it's good for the public to see this. The reason there's so much upset over it is we don't ever see this anymore. So people think this is unusual, but this is supposed to be the norm. These people are there, they're representing you and me, they're our voice, and we have a right to see how the sausage is made they just rarely let us do it because they do their own parochial interest things instead of uh, working for you and me. I'm not sure McCarthy will get there. There are five Republicans who said they will never vote for him. He can only afford to lose four. That would mean Democrats would have to support him. And I don't think there's a Democrat that will because they're going to, they'll get primaried if they help out the Republicans. But I think this is a wonderful thing. I'm glad they're doing it, and I hope they fight it out until we get the right guy. I am not a McCarthy guy. Never have uh, been. Okay. Ken, I think you uh, have a slightly different take on this. Well, I agree with uh, Ray that this is a great thing for Democrats. I mean, this is the Republicans fighting with themselves. Please do so. They didn't learn the lesson of the Tea Party in the early 90, in the 2010s. They, they, I thought they learned their lesson that they have to not fight each other and fight the Democrats. You have a group of people, 20 people, Freedom Caucus, who are holding up and blackmailing the Republican Party. That, I mean, this is not the way government, government should be. Kevin McCarthy has an absolute majority of Republicans voting for him and not getting the leadership. I don't like Kevin McCarthy. I think there's far better people, not Jim Jordan, but far better people. And by the way, nominating 
Donald Trump the day before the anniversary of the insurrection <laughs> to be Speaker of the House? Really? This is a good view for the world? Listen, this is the Republicans saying they can't lead. And that's exactly why they didn't have a red sweep in November. And this is showing the American public exactly who they are and how dysfunctional they can be. Is there... Is this just either personal animosity by some of these folks against or dislike against McCarthy? Is it ideological or is it is it old fashioned deal making? Uh, you want my vote. you got to give me this. I think it's flexing their muscles. I think the Freedom Caucus wants to say, listen, we've got power. We've been left out. Uh, we're not going to be neglected. Do this or else. I think it's, it's a power play. That's that's right. what I think it is. Well, I see it differently. For me, I mean, I followed Kevin McCarthy. He's been in leadership for 14 years. You cannot make a case our country is better off with him in leadership. He has no governing ideology. So the problem is most people, it's okay to compromise. It's not okay to capitulate. McCarthy will always capitulate to get what he wants. Here's a good example. He has now agreed to allow one member to challenge the chair's leadership because he's making concession after concession after concession. And that's the problem. McCarthy it has no governing ideas. He is basically, in a, in a way you could call him a pragmatist, but it's worse than that because a pragmatist is usually looking for the best thing. McCarthy is looking for best, what's best for him. And I think he's demonstrated it in this fight. And you know, I'll say to the two eights, to the comment you made, Ken, about 200 people, Look, if you lead the game until the two minute warning and then the other team ends up winning in the last two minutes, well, you led till the two minute warning. He needs 218 or he needs a majority of members present and he doesn't have it. But whomever's going to take his place, Ray, is going to have to make the same concessions or they won't be elected either. That's blackmail and that's why it's an impasse. Okay. Yeah, I don't agree with that. I think Steve Scalise is someone who has the respect of both sides. And I think if McCarthy no would do it, could do it. Well, no they Democrat. wouldn't. Bl they, no, but they do respect him. Jared Golden and I had a conversation about Scalise in October, and he has great respect for him as a person. They don't respect McCarthy. Let's move on looking forward over 2023 in Maine. Here's your chance for your predictions. We'll, we'll, we'll save the tape and uh, look at them a year from now. Um, what do we see for the, the biggest issue facing Maine in 2023 politically? Ray, you first. Well, I think the biggest issue we're going to face is the appetite for spending at Augusta. We spending a lot of money currently on government, and I don't know how our citizens are better for it. Um, State Representative Amy Arada was in my studio on Tuesday, and she believes that a tax cut is possible. Um, and I said to her at the time, and I'll say it here again, I hope she's right, but I don't see how with the people that are leading the charge, Governor Mills and Troy Jackson and Rachel Tabot Ross. I just don't see that happening. I think somehow trying to find a way to control the spending appetite of these folks is going to be the biggest challenge. But what I hope they work on, what I hope they work on is child protective services. I hope everybody gets a chance to read the Ombudsman's report. It is, uh, it is a debacle that we must deal with, and we must deal with it now. Okay. Ray, your prediction. My, you mean me. Uh, so no, no problem. We're twins. Uh, it's the economy, stupid. That is going to be the focus. Uh, lack of for, workforce, uh, the lobster industry being under attack, uh, bracing for a potential increase in inflation, which I hope not, but certainly potential re recession. So the focus should be on the economy. I agree with Ray about DHHS. It's long overdue. I think she wants to emphasize education, but I think she's made strides in that area. So I don't think that's as critical. Economy, the lobster industry, tourism, and the workforce. That's what we need to focus on. All right. Winners and losers of the week. Ken, you first. So I think the winner of the week is Jenna Mills. Uh, she did her victory lap. She won by a, a great majority. She is going to have a steady hand on the rudder. I think she's the winner of the week. I think the loser of the week is clearly the Republicans in U.S. Congress. They can't lead. They can't get a consensus. They're being blackmailed by their own parties. It's the Republicans eating their young. Thank you. That'll help us if you keep it up. <laughs> Ray, winners and losers. Well, I'm going to completely disagree with my good friend, Ken. I think the winners are the American people because they're actually getting to see a big decision being made in the sunshine. And that's for the Speaker of the House. Keep in mind, third in line to the presidency. This is a big deal. 
The American people are used to backroom deals where they have no say. Now people can watch it on C-SPAN, which has been magnificent. And they can call their congressmen and they can give them input on what's happening. I think this is wonderful. And I hope going forward, there's more of it. There you go. Thank you both very much. Happy New Year. Our first chance to say that to the two of you. And New Center Maine will continue right after this.